to begin with, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to the stage Andy Maltz of the Academy itself. Andy Maltz is the project director for ACES. He co-authored the two books of the Digital Dilemma series and also the Academy's landmark reports on long-term preservation of digital motion pictures. Andy Maltz is also, amongst other things, representing the Academy on science and technology issues at industry, government, and academic forums. Andy, welcome to the stage. Thank you, Julian. Thanks very much. Hello, everybody. Welcome to ACES at the big screen. Uh, certainly not the first time that we've presented on ACES here at IBC, uh, but just so I know the audience I'm speaking with, uh, who's, raise your hand, please, uh, if you've actually heard of ACES. Ah, very good. Now, if you could raise your hand if you've actually used ACES. Okay, that's, that's pretty good. That's better than the last time I was here. All right, so um, just to um, level set a little bit here, I'd like to take a step back uh, for a minute and set context for what you're about to hear, starting with the question of, well, why do we need a production standard? Well, the motion picture industry was built on standards, and if, if you think about film uh, actually as being a container for images, uh, we all think in terms of digital containers, uh, it's described by standards, 35 millimeter film, sprockets, aperture, described by SMPTE standards, and there are ISO standards as well. There's picture metadata in the film system, so raw stock identification, key code, and those are also both SMPTE and ISO standards. And then there's supporting pieces for the system, uh, real cores, leader, you need those things really for the whole system to work, also uh, SMPTE and ISO standards. And then there are a number of best practices and engineering guidelines that are also described by, by official published uh, uh, peer-reviewed documents. Um, and then the image format technical specs, the actual characteristics of the film themselves, uh, they're provided by a small number of, were provided by a small number of leading companies uh, within this standardized framework. And, uh, you know, they're, they're I'll, I'll get to that in just a second, but, and I'm going to limit this discussion to picture, but the same is true for sound. So here's a few visual aids, uh, spectral response curves for Kodak film and for Fujifilm film, and also the, the recipe for the soup in which to develop this film, all very well documented. And, and you could argue that there's variations on, it, on the theme at the various film labs, at least when there were a lot of film labs, but they, they'd all be organized around a baseline. Now, I want to emphasize the leadership issue here, that the film manufacturers played a key role in standardizing our, our infrastructure. Now, these standards, they enabled many, many decades of qualitative improvements across the, the entire motion picture industry. If you think about color, widescreen, multi-channel sound, and the incremental improvements in lenses, film stocks, projection, and sound, you, you would not have seen these sorts of systematic improvements without standardized infrastructure. So now that we've transitioned to digital, or actually as we transition to digital, we lost our standardized infrastructure. And, and to illustrate that, let me just walk through the timeline here for you. So in the 1990s and 2000s, early 2000s, we saw the introduction of digital visual effects, uh, digital intermediate, and during that period of time, we had film capture, so we still had our standards. We processed digitally, and there really were no standards there, but you, we got away with it. Uh, there was a film out, and there were standards there, and then you'd put film in the archive, so standards still existed there. Then as we got into the 2000s and the, and the next decade and with the introduction of digital projection around the world, we still had film capture, so that part of the standardized infrastructure was there. We processed digitally and there were no standards there, but we continued to get away with it. Uh, DCPs, we have standards, even, even though they're still being rolled out, but we do have standards there. Uh, and then uh, people were still archiving a film out, so we still had standards there. And then as we got into this decade and we, we became all digital, pretty much all digital, so we're mostly all digital capture. There's still a few movies shot on film, uh, but mostly it's all digital. No standards there. Uh, we process digitally, no standards there. We do have distribution standards, uh, and what goes into the archive? So uh, you could say we're in pretty good shape on the distribution and exhibition side, you know, 90%, 97% digital in the US, and we're upwards of 80%, Dave, I think, uh, worldwide. But for motion picture production and archives, we have no standardized digital container other than DPX, SMPTE 268, uh, ST268. There are no metadata standards for motion picture production. Uh, there are no standard image specifications. There are no uh, due process uh, RPs and EGs or engineering guidelines. 
So we have no standardized infrastructure in the digital world. So upstream in production and downstream in the archives, we have no standards. Now, some may be thinking, well, there's no problem. Box office has never been higher. What, $36 billion uh, globally last year and seems to keep going up? Well, that's, that's true. Uh, now, the industry is great. Our industry is great at making things work. And with the standardization effort around distribution and presentation, that was the thing. Digital projection and answer print quality. And DCI, the Hollywood Studios, and our international partners, and SMPTE did a fantastic job at addressing that thing. Standardized digital projection uh, at answer print quality. But there are other things that we need to be paying attention to. Next generation cinema, where, where are we going with high dynamic range and wider color gamuts? And, and, and what about virtual reality and computational cinematography? Those are nascent, if you will, technologies and, and creative places for expansion. Uh, and it's still being figured out, but there are no standards there, no baseline standards. And then there's another other thing, and that's the digital dilemma. What's the, long, the preservation strategy, long-term preservation strategy for digitally created motion pictures? The digital dilemma is not solved because there is no long-term digital archiving replacement for the film system. Well, that's how we get to ACES or where we get to ACES. And uh, Julian uh, gave uh, you a pretty good description in one sentence of what ACES is, and I think that uh, bears repeating. ACES is a free, open, device-independent color management and image interchange system that enables creation of digital masters suitable for long-term archiving. So another way of looking at ACES is that it's the digital replacement for the infrastructure that film provided us in production, mastering, and long-term archiving. Now I'll tell you what ACES is not. Because people ask us, well, what is ACES? How do I get my hands on ACES? Well, it's not a software application that you can download and run. You can't just double click on a website and get it. It's not a workflow. It's there to help you build your own workflows. And it's not a look. Uh, the look is determined by the filmmaker, by the director, cinematographer, colorist in, in some cases, but it's really the, the, the creative leadership of the, the production that determines the look. ACES does not do that for you. Well, let's come back to what ACES is specifically. It's a suite of encoding specifications. So how do you record the zeros and ones and code the zeros and ones that make up the pixels on the screen? It's a set of transform definitions and guidelines. So how you bring your imagery into the system and send it back out uh, and, and guidelines for how you do that. Metadata definitions, because we saw in the film system, you do need metadata definitions for a system. It's an archive ready image data and metadata container specification. Actually, there's more than one of those. It's a set of developer tools to enable product and, and pipeline designers to integrate these technologies into their products and services. And it's a set of standard, standards, already standardized by SMPTE and soon by ISO. So if you go out on the show floor and you go visit some of these companies that are known as ACES product partners and ask them about how ACES is implemented in their products, they'll tell you that. So please visit them and ask them to show you their ACES enabled wares. I'm sure they'll be glad you asked about it. So where is ACES used? Here's just a sampling of, of movies. There are a whole bunch more. Uh, that's Elysium on the left. Uh, we also have uh, Oblivion, A Million Ways to Die in the West. That's not up here. Dolphin Tale 2, the Lego movie. And if you go to uh, IMDB or shotonwatt.com, you can actually do a search based on ACES and see which productions have been done using ACES, at least that are logged up there. And there are well over 40 or 50 on there at the moment. So I'm going to dig a little bit into uh, the specifics of ACES. So it is a comprehensive infrastructure. ACES 1.0 is the first production-ready release of the system. As, as most of you know, they've been coming here for the number of years. We've been talking about ACES for many years. So we took all of that experience while we were working on it over the last uh, 10 or 11 years or so and folded it into a version 1 release that's stable. So this developer's kit that was released to equipment manufacturers in December of last year that contains finalized core encoding and transform specifications. There's supporting infrastructure components, metadata, implementation guidelines, and procedures. 
And, and this is perhaps one of the most important bits, industry-wide adoption support. Now, if ASUS was being deployed by a commercial platform company like uh, Google or Microsoft or Apple, there'd be a fleet of developer relations people out there teaching you how to use all this stuff and putting out all these tools. But you know, the academy is, is a nonprofit cultural institution, but it is absolutely appropriate for us to show up in certain ways to help with the industry's adoption. And coming to this program and sponsoring an event like this is, is one of the ways that we do that. So this wouldn't be a technical talk without some block diagrams, so, so I don't disappoint any of you. Here's a production-centric view of what ACES is. So it's production on the left, distribution on the right, and all of those acronyms you see, uh, so we got a little like, uh, here we go, do we have this? Does that show up? There we go. So ACES CC, ACES Clip, all of these, these things are the ACES components that you would find within uh, Onset and Dailies and Onset Color Correction. Uh, these are the ACES components that you'd find in post-production and editorial. In mastering, these are the ACES components that you would expect to see there, same for visual effects. And then in the archive, you'll notice uh, these are SMPTE standard numbers that are, are referenced, so unambiguous archival standards. And in distribution, there's nothing because that's already been handled. Uh, we're just working upstream. Now, upstream. So just as a reminder as to how we had no uh, production infrastructure in the digital world, there were really only two production standards before ACES showed up, uh, DPX and HDSDI. You can see that we need a lot more than that for a production, a standard production infrastructure. So here's uh, the engineering-centric view. Again, the, uh, the items in color, whoops, let's back up a little bit. There we go. The items in color are the ACES pieces, the encodings. We actually added a few more encodings to make it easier to actually use this stuff. Transforms to get in, transforms to get out, and then the rest of this stuff is what we're used to working with. So all this stuff is available at oscars.org, uh, or you can take a picture if you'd like. So for the color scientists uh, in the audience, I didn't want to disappoint you guys by not having a CIE uh, colorimetry diagram. So there you go. Uh, there's the big ACES triangle. That covers everything within the spectrum locus. But it turns out that it's really hard to do color manipulation in that wide of a space. So we came up with a new encoding with a smaller set of primaries called AP1 primaries, that's the red triangle, and that encompasses all of the encodings that are commonly in use uh, today and where we think we're going. So this is a way that we're future-proofing uh, your content and also expanding the palette uh, uh, for all colors that we think people will be using. So everything, uh, all 17 documents, 870 CTL files, 70 reference images, and an OCI config, OCIO config are available here on our website for free. Uh, so uh, that the Academy is facilitating the development adoption, but we're not actually building the products. That's up to the folks on the show floor, which leads me to the ACES logo program. Now, usually logos are about branding, but in this case, we realize that an industry-wide behavioral shift is, is needed, and a little motivation to do that would probably help. So that's where we came up with the ACES logo. It's a mechanism to encourage high-quality ACES implementations. It's also an end-user communications device. Uh, quality, it means quality ACES color management on products associated with the ACES logo. Predictable ACES experience, you know what you're going to get. And to date, 23 companies have signed on to the program, and you can identify ACES product partners by seeing this logo in their booth. And within the coming months, you'll actually see uh, some ACES logoed products. An education plan, I'm just gonna blow through this quickly because I wanna make time for uh, people that have actually used ACES to talk. We have a lot of education partners, the American Society of Cinematographers, International Colors Academy. They're having a mixer uh, tomorrow night, I believe, so if you wanna drink some beer, good beer, you know, come, come out and sign up for that. The Producers Guild of America, the Visual Effects Society, we have more partners coming. Plenty of resources on the web. Again, we'll make sure this presentation is posted, so unless you've taken a picture of this, you don't have to memorize it. And then, of course, end user support, an online community-driven help desk. And then at the end, we'll have plenty of time for questions, and that's the introduction. <laughs>